Let's talk about you. It, can you can you give us the the condensed version? What have you done since we set you free in the world? Oh, um, what year was that? What when did you graduate? Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. Um, summer of twenty thirteen. So my first book came out in twenty fifteen, and then I had another book in twenty seventeen, and then my most recent book in May of twenty nineteen. And I have another book coming out in 2021 and then uh, fall 2022. So. so you have two more coming out in the next. Uh, yeah, I have. Technically, I owe them three more books, but we'll focus on the <laughs> ones that are most like concrete and not just like in the ether right now. So, yeah. Okay. okay if we're going to focus on them, give us the names and their pub dates approximately. Oh. Um, for what's like coming up or what has come out? <laughs> coming up. Okay. Um, so The Shape of Thunder is coming in May 11th, 2021. And I actually realized I said that about the other books and I can't, I shouldn't talk about them yet. So we'll, we'll talk about the one that's coming in May. Okay. So we'll, let's just flash back on stuff you've already done. Okay. Such as, um, New Honor, how much did it change you? How did it change you? How did it change your life? Um, I Congratulations, by the way, again. Oh, thank you. It's so very surreal. It's like you, I mean, you know, you've gotten one of those calls that come at an absurd hour, but I, I still, like, can't quite believe it happened because I literally woke up from, like, a dream state into that phone call. Um, I my ringer hadn't been on on my phone and so what i remember is greg nudging me and being like i think your phone's ringing like and i guess they tried a couple of other times it slept through it and then picking up and just hearing the committee chair's voice and not really ha knowing what to say i think i just burst into tears and then i remember i talked to <laughs> Alessandra, and i was like I know it's like 4 a.m. in the morning, and so I don't want to wake you up, but um, I think that I the book just won a new very honor. And she said, we fucking know. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, like, and then they all called me. And so, yeah, it's very, it's really surreal. Um, I think the, the lead up to it was kind of stressful, which I've talked to people who've been in the industry for a long time. They say that it's gotten like harder in some ways for writers because there's all this like mock Newberry stuff and people are like really well-meaning and they mean to be excited, but you're being like tagged. There's a lot out there. Like second on social media about being like our group, you know, selected your book for our mock Newberry club or whatever. So it was definitely like in the air of something that I was aware of. I wish I like had not been because I think that's a really bizarre situation um to be in but um yeah no I just feel really like and I think that for me it affords you a longer runway to be able to like fight to do the type of books that you want to do and I think they're going to be they're more willing to like take risks with you that you might have not been able to before so I'm like excited oh. about, about that that's the part that I think is the most um exciting to me and then the the larger part of it of like this particular story like the Newberry is such an American award and I remember like that's what I read growing up where those books that had the stickers on them but they were never like about Muslim or Arab kids and so to like kind of be told like this is an American story is like really meaningful to me. Sure. Um, yeah on a similar note <clears throat> after you got it you know how you're saying the, the Mark Newberries and all that were kind of, there was a lot of buzz and interference, radio interference yeah. going on. How about once you went back to your desk after all the dust settled? Was anything getting in that wasn't helpful or was it all positive? Because when you talk about that thing that you said, you felt like more free to take more risks. I felt that back in 2013 that you needed to feel that way. Yeah. Do you remember me nudging you? So, I, so I'm, I'm thanking the Newberry Committee for helping me out with my job still. <clears throat> so that, uh, in my mind, you should already be doing because you should, for many, for the reasons that you know, you should be, you should be out there on the edge. Thank you. 
pushing your creative self. However, about the stuff that's coming in the window that maybe you don't want, well, did you find any of that? Yeah, I mean, I was lucky enough that I was already so far into the draft of The Shape of Thunder. I think that if I had been staring at a blank page, because for me, first drafts are always the hardest. It's when I doubt everything about the story. I feel like you're making all these really big choices and it's hard for me to understand every time I make those big choices and then I rearrange them later on. But um, the first draft is always the most like wrecked with self-doubt and anxiety for me. And I was already pretty far into the shape of thunder at the point we got that news, which I think was really great because I was almost able to like escape into the story um, in like revision mode, which is just different than trying to draft something. And it's such a different story from Other Words for Home. Like it's in prose, it's not in verse, it's two narrators, it's more like brainy as opposed to um, like... Cerebral rather than visceral. Yeah, and so I think it's just like, it's a different, it's a totally different type of story. And I think that that made it easier. Of course, I had those moments of panic of being like, oh my gosh, everyone is being so positive about other words for home. Why am I doing a story that is like completely different? Like, shouldn't I, like, it would make sense to like follow um, what had worked with something that's like in that vein, but Again, that I it's just not what I was interested in doing. And I, and I think that I was lucky enough that I was like already on the path of having made that choice. So I didn't have to like feel that again. Um, I also think like the fact everything has gotten shut down has in a way made it easier because I did a couple of events right after the Newberry announcement. And those definitely felt like different to me. Um, and I think that can get in your head, but I didn't like, I don't, haven't seen people, which is like, so I think it hasn't been able to get in my head as much as maybe it would have if we hadn't had lockdown. Like, I'm able to worry that no one's gonna like this new book, but I'm also like fixated on worrying like that. Okay. Our public isn't gonna exist anymore. So there's like, like only so much room for like that kind of um, existential anxiety, I guess. Well, Sarah, the lovely Sarah, when we did this, Two weeks ago, <clears throat> she talked about it, and I've heard her talk about it a number of times. And it's probably, it's probably really helpful for this population you're talking to right now. <clears throat> the difference between writing when you're still in a program like that, and writing as somebody who's writing for a publisher, and writing as somebody who's been published. Mm -hmm. Do you find various different influences coming at your work? Because I know she found a big difference. Like suddenly there are expectations and there are people who see you as this kind of writer <clears throat> and you, you can feel the squeeze of the possibilities of who you could be narrowing down. Did you feel anything like that? Or do you feel some people feel like you've given me the keys to the car and I'm going to drive it? Um, I'd say I'm somewhere in between that. I think um, like, other Words Were Home was a big departure because I had the two YA books and I think Harper in some ways felt like let's just do another YA book like they're working well enough um and so it was a little not a fight but a little bit of like um a leap of faith on their part to t try something different and once that happened I feel like I have felt more secure and that for me like I guess I've always been worried about what Sarah's talking about. And so it's been like some of my decisions of like which book to do next have been because I don't want to get on this road, which can be a really great road because the books work. And, um, but I don't want to have like a, a certain type of book that I'm branded for like all the careers that I admire the most when I look at people um, who've done this for a long time they're the thing that links the books are like the quality of the writing not the subject matter or the style or the form and so um it's like i i feel like i purposely made like decisions of which book to do next because of that i think that um in terms of the pressure i don't know i was really like anxious when i was in the program so i feel like the 
anxiety and pressure that I felt is like similar. It didn't, like, it didn't show. Yeah, it's it's to want to to write the best possible book that I can write, and um, I don't know. I I worry a lot about like the the choice of project, which is something that I worried a lot about in the program. So I don't know if that's hopeful anybody's watching that. But I haven't. I I, I don't know. Believe I, I recall that. I don't think that. I think that in some ways, I don't know. I think that honestly, one thing I will say is for me talking with other friends now who are published writers who did MFA programs, a lot of them who did like full residency MFA programs, I feel like have had more of a jarring experience because they like had so much time in school to write. And I was like working a full-time job when I was in the program. And so I think I learned how to write under less than ideal circumstances and that skill has like now served me well when I have a deadline from my publisher as opposed to having a deadline for school but whether that was like waking up super early before work to do the writing or now with my kids like if I was up at 3 a.m anyways sitting down and doing the work so it's like I learned to that my life didn't like accommodate writing and I think that's a skill that's something I think about a lot that that's something I kind of learned um through the program was how to write on a deadline when not everything in your life was like super cushy to make that possible to do that you're welcome for that and um and and I am so thrilled to even hear that because I mean that's the way I felt to make this quick there were, there were several years between undergrad and graduate school for me. And when I went back, I was married and I had, I had an infant and I went back and, you know, there's this program full of people who are special, you know, creative writers. And then I, I was, I was appalled. I was listening to, you know, I can't write when it's snowy. I can't write when it's rainy. I can't write when the guy across the street has this, has his shade halfway down. I can't write. I can't write. I'm like, you can write when the baby says you can write. Yeah. And that's the best thing that could happen to you because the most underrated part of this gig is that, yes, there are many elements to it, but it is above all else a discipline field. You don't sit around waiting for the fairies to come and bop you on the head and just hand it to you. Yeah. So, no, yeah, and and we gave you something good there. Yeah, I think that's something that was, like, honed um, – in the experience of the program and it has served me well because like this new book that's coming out in May, a large chunk of it was written with my, she's three now, but my two year old, it was like sick, like sitting on me while I wrote it. And so it's just, you, you learn how to like fit your writing into the crevices of the rest of your life, I guess. And when you do have a block of time under those circumstances, you don't waste it. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> I used to, I will like write, and I talk about this at school visits sometimes, like, and the kids think I'm crazy, but like, if I get, when my kids were in preschool, if I got to like the pick up early, I'd be like typing on my phone, like things that I thought of on the drive, using every minute of time that I have. And I also, I guess something I also sort of learned about myself in the program and have taken to now my writing life is that so much of my writing is actually like my thinking and being conscious to protect like that kind of psychic space of, of thinking and using my time wisely for that. So it's like on the drive when I'm taking them to school, thinking like yeah. that plot, not so that when it, I actually have the time to sit down and like ready to go. Um, yeah, so I think a lot about time, which is something that I think I learned to value. Um, in a, in a lot of ways, you've been in school since you left us. Yeah, I mean, I've been on deadline, I guess, um, trying to uh, finish, finish the books or... Uh, okay. Um, Light change of subject, again, addressing your alumni audience here. Okay. Um, are you still in, charge, in touch with people from yeah. who, you, who you went to Leslie with? Well, I'm in touch with Erica uh, still, but and Sarah, 
Um, and then I like, because social media has made it so you can be in touch with someone that you said, like met once in your life. I'm like in touch with a, n a number of them and that like, I like their pictures on Instagram or will like message to say congratulations when I see they like get a poem published somewhere, but not in like, um, a like substantive talk with them. Right. a lot type of way but um definitely i still talk a lot with uh sarah and eric and i got to see sarah at ncte last year uh, in person which was really fun because that was the first time i'd seen her in person in a, in a while is that right yeah yeah and we uh, ended up bumping into david elliott too which was just like funny like um thing of the universe we just were getting coffee before her her panel but yeah um Okay, a little more esoteric here. Okay. And, um, Sarah and I were talking about uh, music vis-a-vis -vis writing, okay. and which of course flashes me back to what you had with you when you showed up. Okay. The, the, your material and so steeped in the music and with each character having their own theme song and they walked onto a scene and all that stuff. What is your relationship with music? Can you listen to music and write at the same time? Do you do that? Does it have to be just instrumental music or does, does it have to be completely separate? Or you listen to music and later it feeds into your work. Um, and, and are you still writing music into your work? Yeah, so good question. I think that I realized a few years ago that my love of music in most ways is a love of lyrics. I think it's like the poetry part of music, which was what I responded to a lot as a young person and still do today. Um, and that I'm kind of a novice when it comes to being able to pull out like, is that a guitar or is that a bass line or whatever that might be. Uh, whereas like Greg, my husband, for example, when he hears songs, the way he'll talk about them is like completely different than I'll be talking about like the metaphor that's in this certain <laughs> verse. Um, and so I, when it comes to music, definitely informs my work and is a big part of like just my creative life and consumption of art. Um, when it comes to like actually writing books, I either have to listen to like the same song on repeat, like a serial killer. <laughs> like, so it like becomes like, background noise almost so I'm not so distracted or it has to be a song that I know so well like I can't just like put on the radio or like a Spotify like playlist and just work because I would keep getting distracted by like oh what's that song or what are those lyrics but when I'm conceiving the book like I had talked a lot about how like this brainstorming thinking is such a huge part like it'll be like I put on these songs while I'm like cleaning my house or I put on these songs where I'm like you know, walking the dog and that like jogs my memory and informs um, my work. And definitely, I think like it's, there's like a huge correlation, but I think like lots, like all of my art consumption affects my writing. And like, I am like kind of purposeful about that, especially I don't know how it is for you, but like when I'm working on a project, I'm really specific about what I'm willing to read. Like, I don't want to read things that are too close to what I'm trying to do because I don't want to like um grift something unintentionally but I also need it to like have sometimes I have to read within like the sensibilities so that I don't bring the wrong voice quality to like the project just because I think I'm a little bit of a mimic in that way that what I read and consume really like affects like the sensibility of what I'm producing at the time. That makes complete sense. Um, more esoteric. I just, I'll just pull stuff out of, out yeah. of the air here because, because I just, I just look at a bunch of um, interviews that I like with, with artists and makers of, of various kinds and I just pull a lot of stuff out of there. Yeah. Um, well, some of these questions you have to just answer me kind of right away, okay? You don't get too much time to think. Okay. What's, your, what's your favorite word? Isn't that tough for a words person? Yeah, that is weird. I, I, I have two like things that come to mind because it's like what I say, a word that I use all the time, which would be like- That's what Sarah thought I meant. And, and she was giving me like just and things like that. Oh, I was like, nope, your favorite word. 
I feel like all my emails are always like, that's fantastic. Like, I feel like that's such a Midwestern um, thing. And another Midwestern thing that comes to mind that I always get made fun of for saying is like spendy. Do you use that term? But I use it to mean like something that's like expensive. Um, nope. I remember <laughs> I used to have to talk you out of using super so much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I think there's a lot of like Midwestern um, ticks like that in my writing. In terms of like words that I love, um, let me think like aggregate is a word that I love. I love like the way that it makes sounds. sense. Um, patina is another word that I love. Like I like words that, that sound like what they are. And that's like hard sometimes to explain, but I feel like as a writer, you will get that. But it's like, I like those words that like when you were a little kid and you learned them in school, it was easy to remember them because it made sense that that's what the word meant. Okay, excellent answer, excellent explanation on the spot and everything. <clears throat> what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> she throws the coffee down. Oh, it might be caffeine. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, our president, like, and, and the fact that he is our president um, keeps me awake at night and then just kind of existential dread about the climate, I think. I'll get in my own head about that and keeps me awake at night, which I feel like is lots of people have that. And I especially think when you're raising young people and you're thinking about like the world that like they're going to live in that, that gets you. And then um, probably in part because of the book that I've been working on, but things about gun violence keep me up a lot at night. Cause I like learned all the statistics while uh, working on the book, like how like 4.6 million American children have access to like unlocked firearms and so things like that um keep me awake okay i get it um can you think of now don't make this list too extensive because we want to rein this in a little bit okay. authors you didn't like as a kid who you later said oh wait a minute i get it now in like kids books or just like and no anything that you as a younger person yeah. didn't didn't go for but later you did because it's like hard for me to think about that because i feel like the books that i loved as a kid like i love and i still admire those people and the books i didn't like as a kid i haven't been a big enough person to like return to them to see if i would feel differently about them but um oh, that's such that's a difficult question i'm trying to think about like kind of classic books you read in high school if there's anything that if anything, it's the opposite for me, which is bad. Like things that I was like wowed by and high school. <laughs> well, it's, it's not necessarily bad. That means you've traveled a certain road and you've learned a bunch of stuff and you you became more discerning. To like interrogate it more, to ask questions about, I don't know, different types of questions about them. But um, I guess like in a pot, like on a positive note, like things that, like, oh, I remember being introduced to Zadie Smith my junior year in high school, and she's been a writer who was, like, consistently um, impressed me even more, and I think that I've gotten to, like, see her work in a different way. Um, I'm trying to think. I have never really finished Moby Dick. I still haven't. I don't really feel that bad about it. <laughs> Give yourself a break. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, I don't have a good answer to that question because I'm trying to think of things that I didn't like that I now like and that's not, I guess like I don't have been, like I haven't really gone back to books that I didn't like that much. Um, I have had instances where it's like I started the book and then I didn't finish and then I'm like why did it take me so long like read this book which was like how it was for me it was like middle sex like lots of these books that like super blow up I feel like I would read like the first chapter and I would like it enough but almost like the hype around it was so deafening that I didn't like read it then and so then I'm that person reading like the book everyone loved like 15 years ago being like this book is amazing and I was like yeah, we, we all knew that we all read this book already so I have that I have that experience a lot I guess um, but definitely not in terms of like classics. And then I, I just loved so many books as a kid. I feel like the books that I was given in general, I feel like I'm a reader who, who likes the book, like really likes the book, um, which is what's interesting to me today. I feel like there's like a culture of reading a book 
with the intent, like almost being like, this needs to impress me. Like I'm, I'm reading it from the standpoint of, I don't think I'm going to like it. Whereas like, I always have read books assuming I'm going to like them. And most of the time finding something about it that I do like. And that's what I remember as my reading experience as a kid. Like I listened to lots of writers talk about how they didn't like reading as a kid. They didn't find any reason. I don't know. I was like reading all of the books and always like liking all of the books. So um, I don't know. <coughs> I'm balancing the universe for you on that one. <laughs> I was like, read the um, I had one, hold on. What books have made you cry? if any. Oh, that's a good question. Um, Again, it doesn't have to be a long list. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, actually, just read, I cry a lot of books, so that's like an easy question to answer. So I'll just talk about most recently, I just finished Transcendent Kingdom by Yagasi, and that book made me uh, tear up. Um, just in its rendering of like opioid addiction, which I think is something that is affecting lots of uh, people. Um, what else this is like classically has made me cry? Well, when I was a kid, the first, I remember my mom reading Charlotte's Web aloud to me and I cried. So it's probably the first book that ever like made me cry. And I just cried again. I read a lot to my four year old. So, so. <laughs> very good. Um, and Bridge of Terabitha is the first book I remember reading myself that made me cry. Cause that was like such a kind of, um, like scarring experience to realize that like reading a book yourself can make can make you cry when like your mom isn't there reading it aloud to you and then I cried at all the dead dog books they had us read and like it's great I remember like where because that was like the year of the dogs like where the red friend grows like Shiloh like etc and cried at all of them um if there yeah if there's an animal that gets hurt I'm definitely crying and now I'm like even I feel like the older I get the easier that I cry at books this year. I cry at like everything. I was super moved. I don't know if you've read, there's this new novel that came out a couple of months ago called Writers and Lovers by Lily King. But it has like this ending that's just like really was emotionally moving to me about basically how like being a writer is an insane thing to do. And it doesn't really make any sense at all. But like for the character in the book as a writer, but like for them, like why and how grounding it has been. And I was just really, I don't know, I was really moved by that. So yeah, the list is, is long. I, I cry easily at books, especially at kids' books and books by like our people working today like make me um, cry. Like they move me. I don't know. I easily cry at books, I guess. <laughs> I definitely hear you on the animal thing. <clears throat> I've done horrible things to humans in my books. And um, it's like, you know, you bruise, a, you bruise an animal and you hear about it. And this yeah. was this was well before the era of social media. I um, I wrote a brutal series of books. It was, it was brutal <laughs> in in human terms, but in one of the three books I included, there was a a running story about organized dog fighting, and I think I pretty much invented the death threat <laughs> when I did that. If I couldn't, I couldn't possibly do it now. And, and sleep ever. <clears throat> but yeah, people people don't want you to do that. Oh, no, people don't like. Yeah. Speaking of, where do you see this segue? Look, and I'm still teaching. Speaking of things people don't like you to do, how do you feel about what your rights are regarding using the lives of people in your life in your fiction? What right do you have? How much right? Where does it start? Where does it end? Is there any? Um. All the time like when I'm designing characters but I never like I'm in the business of design, so I never have done something where it's like so autobiographical actually recently I was considering and I can talk about it because I'm, I'm probably not going to do it but I was considering doing like an auto fiction not like auto fiction I feel like it's the buzzword that's like now like a big um term but I was considering doing like one of those things that's like a memoir, but not a memoir. So it'd be fiction, but the main character's name would be Jasmine. It was going to be the trip, my fa summer trip my family took when I was in seventh grade back to Jordan. And I was like planning on doing it. And I was going to do it. I mean, I feel like I loved that experience. I also feel like um, those are my like 
impressions of the people, like they have the right to tell their story. Like I, what I own is my own experience, which those people are a part of, but it's not like they're the only essence of it. So I don't know. I don't think there's a line. I think that like you have to decide, are you going to be welcome home at the holiday spending on what you write about somebody if you take that from them, which is like, like your, where you see the line might be different from where somebody else sees the line. But I, I use things all the time. I think what's going to be interesting to me, actually, the thing I worry about more is as my kids get older, because it's not like I'm ever writing my kids, but now they're such like a major source of inspiration for me. So I'll like just pull random things like of a tick or a thing that they say and put it in a book. And it's not at all like that character is my kid, but there's definitely like an inspiration source. And right now, like they don't know to know, but I, they may feel differently about that when they're like 13 and 14. Um, so there's that, but yeah, I don't know. I think all writers were inspired, right? By the world around us, by the people around us. And of course you're going to pull things, but I'm not, I'm also like, every single character I write, I feel like in lots of ways is like a, a part of myself too. And then I like, um, acclimate it with things that I pulled from other people. So like philosophically, I don't think there's a line, but myself, I've never like bumped up against that to really test that theory in any like meaningful way. If you ever run low on material, you know, after you've been doing this for a long time, and you start thinking, hmm, I think I need to use a bit more of this stuff, you start hearing about it. <clears throat> you mentioned your trip to Jordan. Let me combine a couple of questions here. How much, how much prep do you put into your books? How much research? How much writing-related travel have you done? And have you made any... Conscious literary pilgrimage type of trips. Oh, all good questions. So I am really, really excited about a book that I can't talk about yet, but it's my first book that I'm doing like lots of research, like outside of the story for. And it's been really, really exciting because I'm nerdy in that way and I like obsessing learning information and so I feel like it gets I get to use that side of my brain that I haven't yet in my books so far um I definitely do like research but all my books so far have been kind of like research light because they are for and foremost like emotional stakes of characters and I feel like that's just a human study as opposed to like a fact building study um I have not done like going to a place, I think that if I did write a book set in Jordan, um, I mean, I've been there so many times, but I might try to like do some kind of like research trip right off just to be able to take the trip and go back um, and see the whole course. Like, um, so I think that like, I would love to do that. I just, so far, most of my books have been set in a fictionalized version of suburban-ish small town Ohio where I grew up, um, which doesn't require like a pilgrimage to go there, but I'm hopeful to like expand that. I, I think that I'm nervous to do books that require a lot of research as in the one that I'm starting because I do have that like obsessive type personality where I will, it's going to be like a matter of like cutting it off to be like, okay, now you actually like need to sit down and do the like learning obscure facts about this doesn't make a novel and doesn't write a novel. And so I've always been conscious of that, that like for me, I've always written the first draft first and then I've gone back and done like the research I had to do like for Shape of Thunder, I had to like talk with a lot of different teachers about what lockdown drills look like today, all that kind of stuff. But all that research came after uh, I had the book, yeah. That was so good, I, can I just pause that for a second? <clears throat> I haven't heard anybody else say that they do that. Writing through a first draft first, so that you have the essence of what you wanna say, and then going back and researching. That yeah. I think, again, for our audience here, is pretty great advice. 
Yeah, for me, it's like a, a momentum thing. Like even with this one that I talked about needing lots of research, I have a good chunk of it written because I had to have that written to do the proposal for it. And I think that's going to be a guiding light to not just get in this wormhole. Because I think like you can convince yourself that a lot of things are writing that aren't actually writing. And I see this with my friends a lot and it's a different form of procrastination, but unless like you're putting words to the document that move the story forward, that's not the book. And so I think like, obviously well-researched things are important, but we can like bog ourselves down. And I see people taking these really elaborate type trips. I think they're great. And I'm sure they like inform and make the book better, but it's just like, yeah. That, again I'm like a little bit draconian on like you have to do the work side and I'm always like nervous about that with myself so I think that I try to do a large chunk of the work and then for me research is what like adds that shine and sparkle to a, to a book and so you add that in at least for my process I add that in later uh, but like things like voice and character like I have to build outside of that and so I, yeah, yeah. Build, building it outside of that and building it first because I mean that's what the world wants from you is your voice you know you can hire somebody to do all the legwork on the background but your method it just sounds so right to me that you run with your voice first because you probably can't catch that later you've established what it is you feel like the book should sound like and then you plug in all the stuff that it needs to prop it up that's yeah, That's really you, don't, good. you don't want your research to write your book, right? Like you want your view, like the story, we're in like the storytelling business. So you want to know what your story is, what kind of storytelling. I think so many people go on these like fishing expeditions, like to try to use the research to find a story. And I, I guess sometimes that must work, but my process isn't like that. It's like, I know the story I want to tell and then I have to figure out like what things do I need to know in order to tell that story which is like a different. And by writing it the way you're writing it, you also encounter the questions that you're going to need to answer later rather than sitting around pondering. Those holes will present themselves and you'll fill them in later. Yeah, I think, I think so. I also think like I still have like PTSD from being a history major in college. So like I recognize like you can just become completely buried in research and you haven't like narrowed the perimeters. So I'm always very like, worried about falling in that funny hole. Okay, here's a leap. Tell the people, since you've experienced pretty much every strata of this, what is literary success to you? <laughs> um, I think like it's so easy to get caught up in the like external stuff and it, and the external stuff matters and it feels great and like it would be so disingenuous to be like, I don't care about any of that stuff because obviously I do and we all do and it's important to care about those things and they're great. But at the end of the day for me, which is like grounding to me and I, and I, I think about it all the time, especially when I find myself starting to become obsessed with those external things that are out of my control. I thought about this a lot in the lead up to like the ALA awards and stuff that for me, my goal is to be able to write the books that I want to write. And so I think that if you are able to write the books that you want to write and have them published, like that was always my idea of success. And so I try to hold on to that because I think that it's so easy. Again, I feel like I keep repeating myself, but it's so easy to make writing not about the work. And for me, it's always about remembering that it's about the work and about the writing and about doing the writing and like, trying to love the experience of writing like I definitely like have bad days and like feel frustrated but at the end of the day what I want to be the most focused on is like improving my craft and figuring out how to do that and then I think the rest of the stuff comes like I think that's the thing like if you write the books that you want to write and if you spend most of your time thinking about what kind of stories you want to tell. And for me in particular, I think a lot about what type of stories I want to tell for young people. And I think that if you feel connected to that, that those other things come. I think that if you sit down and you're just like obsessed with writing a book that's going to sell this many copies, that again is like that back, it's like to me putting 
the cart before the horse in lots of ways. So I think that for me, success is being able to have the freedom to write the type of stories that you want to write, being afforded that ability. Because it's an enormous like, privilege to get to do what we do, isn't it? Like I think all the time about what like a luxurious job is. That answer could not have been more perfect. Um, and yeah, to put a little bit finer point on it, if you do let yourself get caught up in the sales and the awards and stuff, if you really buy in, I mean, yeah, you're right. Enjoy it. I'll take anything anybody wants to give me. Great. Excellent. But if you start hanging your hat on that stuff, <laughs> then you wind up going from year to year, letting your self-esteem rise and fall based on this stuff. And you go, all of a sudden you're being, you have a great year winning all that stuff. And then you'll have the next year where you're doing the stuff you love. You're still writing. You're, you're, you're still in the game. And because you don't get all that, that stuff that you got just one year earlier, you're like, God, I'm crap now. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't, you can't let them do that to you. Yeah, so I think, and I think it is hard to like, I talk about this a lot with friends, like to care enough, to like enjoy it enough, because you have to be like realistic about those human impulses that things feel nice when like you get nice things and it's okay to want nice things. Um, but at the same time, not letting that be the defining factor. I think that's what you're getting. That's a craft-based goal. So it's like, can I effectively use verse as a form to tell the story or can I write a story from two points of view and first person that both sound distinct and then the question of whether I'm successful in that also like I let myself have the the choice of deciding that in the end whether that was like successfully achieved but I think like having those craft goals for me is important because I feel like I'm always that's how you can feel like growth, which is, I think, what some people use, like, awards and sales for as, like, a measure of progress and growth, and I understand that impulse to want progress and growth, but I think it's just so scary to give your um, power like that to something that is just sort of ephemeral. Do you ever right outside of kids lit. you know i used to say yes because a huge part of my reading life obviously because i'm a grown person is grown books um but the more we enter into like it's so strange because i think like i kind of serendipitously got interested in writing for children because um i was feeling like, really moody my junior year of college and i was just in the library and happened to be in the area where they like house kids books. And I just out of interest, like pulled a few that I loved when I was a kid, was reading them and was remembering again, how like that's when I was the most engaged reader that I've ever been and books meant the most to me and feeling like, wow, I would love to do this. And so kind of getting on that path but always like thinking like, oh, well, maybe, maybe someday I'll want to write something else. But then it's almost like fed that I feel, and this is not to say, and I'm sure people who write adult books don't necessarily feel this way, but I like the thing that saves me from feeling existential about what we do is the readers themselves. Like for me, I love young people. I love working with young people. I was a teacher. Uh, before I was full-time writer and so I think it like combines a lot of my like personal interests and I feel really grounded in wanting like to tell stories to young people and wanting young people to know like that we see them that we love them that we want to hear their voices and that like helps me again to get back to your other question about what literary success is that helps me to feel like not existential about it so much and so right now I love um the audience that I write for I feel really really lucky to write for them um so I don't know I mean but never say never I have like lots of ideas for things that I think could be grown up books but then I'll think about it and again feel like maybe I'd write that book for myself but I don't feel like this yes the like 
I talked to Sarah about this. I don't know if she talked about this on her call, but I feel like when you first start out, you're like so just like thirsty to get a book published. Like you don't think about it. You're just like, oh my God, it would be amazing to like have a book with my name on it in the bookstore. And then like the longer I do this, I actually said this also to Brenda recently. I was like, for me, it's not even anymore about like selling books or getting books published. It's like, I want the books to have meaning. Like I want to be creating a body of work that makes sense to me. And I'm really mindful now of like which products I choose to do and why. And again, I recognize that's like crazy privilege to have. And probably some people here who might be watching this were like so thirsty at publisher rolling their eyes. But I promise you that like someday you may all, you'll also be a little that way. Like it's just like, so I guess I'm not that interested in writing like a grown up novel right now in, in, in that realm, but I don't know about you. Let me piggyback this question on top of basically the answer you already gave me. It's already kind of loaded up for you. <clears throat> what would you say to your younger writing self or let's say people seven years behind you in the Leslie program, do you say a favor, don't do this. Don't take this approach. Do take this approach. Don't do this to yourself. You'll find this more satisfying in the long run. I'm sort of just asking you to repeat yourself again almost, but if you can expand on that a little bit. No, for me, this is actually a little bit different. What I would have told myself was to finish things. Like, and I think that's still a problem for me, but I think that learning to finish your book is like such an important skill. I was such like a project jumper, and I think that you, anyone can write a great 50 pages. It's a totally yeah. different thing to write a complete arc of a novel and to not feel like that's the only book you're ever going to write. I feel like I had real commitment issues with projects because, again, I felt like, oh, is this the one? And it doesn't even have to be. Like, you're going to learn how to finish the book, and then you can totally nuke it and redo it. Like, for Other Words for Home, I had four drafts of it that were in prose before I nuked it and rewrote it in verse. So it's like learning again to, to like commit to the project and then play around within that space as opposed to constantly looking for like the next best idea. I think I put too much weight when I was in the program on ideas. Like I thought that it was all about having the best idea for a story. And again, that takes the weight off the writing. Like you have to learn to commit to like, you can have the best idea in the world, but if you don't write the book and you don't write it in a structurally sound way and it, you don't put it together it doesn't matter how great your idea so that's what I would tell myself is like to be less obsessed with having like amazing avant-garde high concept ideas and more like doing the actual work of writing a book it's excellent that you came to that conclusion it's also understandable why you came to it the way you did the one thing you had limitless creative ideas. Do you remember one time we did one of your small group workshops? We workshopped an idea of yours because in between large group and small group, you started noodling around with this other idea and you didn't have the piece yet, but everybody was so into it that we, we workshopped and I think very productively just an idea, which can be great, which can be intoxicating, but you're right. A lot of the things you're saying this is good. You could be interviewing yourself because you're, in, you're, you're anticipating half of the things I'm going to ask you. One of them was going to be, you know, what, how do you look at it? Do you look at it as each individual book or on some level do you look at it as a body of work, which I think calms you down intellectually? I, used to, I, I became a much less neurotic writer when I realized, listen, you don't have to say everything right now. You're going to say it. You're going to come back to it. And there's going to be another book and another book, as long as you feel like you're getting this book right now. And I think that's the thing for me is remembering that like not every book has to be everything or show every skill that you have in your toolbox as a writer. I think for a while, it's like, I wanted to write a really brainy book, but I also wanted to show that I could do a book that had a lot of heart and also a book that had a lot of like flowery writing, but also a book that like I could show I understood how to write like really succinct punchy sentences and it's like learning that you can again I think getting back to the idea of not being pigeonholed 
like for me, that's been so good to know that like with every book, I can try a different style. I can try this different thing. And it doesn't like every book doesn't have to be every thing. But I think that that's something I really struggled with when I was in the program of wanting to like not also being sure of what kind of writer I wanted to be, like being really like um, confused about that, I guess, in terms of like, do I want to write like really high concept books? Do I want to write really like experimental books? Do I want to write book, mash those together? And then realizing you don't have to choose. It's like a false choice. And again, just to concentrate on what that particular book is. But I think I like got, like I was in my head a lot about like that kind of stuff of not of being like, oh, I need to find my voice. And that's the wrong question. It's like, you need to find the voice for that book. Not like you don't have one voice for your entire career. Very good. Um, do you have what you would consider to be your personal writing kryptonite? And to, to, to narrow that down a little bit, I would say that when I was learning to write, I would have considered it transitions that helped it held me back from being able to write well because I wrote awful transitions I, I when I look back at my my life in real life I see scenes I see the scenes of my life I don't see any transitions so I only had the enthusiasm for writing scenes and then I read play it as it lays and I went I don't have to and that it, honest to God changed everything is there anything, you know, when you, when you say, oh, you know, there's this or this or this that my heart is really not in this part of the writing that, you know, I just, it sort of de-energizes me to think about it, but I will do it if I have to. I think for me that's plot. And I think that what I've learned is that you don't have to think like, and actually my editor has been really great about teaching me this is like, she like stakes are kind of like plot, right? But it seems different to me because I can boil it down to like, this is what my character wants. And I'm not thinking about like mapping out, these are all the things that are gonna happen, but more like, this is the emotional growth my character might have, or just like re-envisioning like what it means to have a plot. I think I would get in my head a lot about that in the program and just like learning that so many it's what you're saying, reading so many books and being like, I couldn't map that plot, but it didn't matter because I was like engaged in the character and what was happening and the questions that were being asked and like seeing ways to like reconsider that. And then I guess also just like on a basic level, the thing I still struggle with is like overwriting. Like I think that all like on one page will have like four metaphors, all of which I think are like kind of solid, but like Alexander would be like, this is like over <laughs> you know, you can't, like none of them are going to, are going to be effective if you've just like dumped your reader that hard in that. And so it's still like a matter of learning that it's okay. Like the reason you cut lines isn't because they're bad writing, but because they're wrong for the story. And I think that's something that I've always really struggled with because I'll get in my own head about being like, I really like the sound of the sentence and it's like, great, but it doesn't do anything for the story. And so remembering, I think something that's like hard and I've been thinking about this a lot as like a novel writer is we're still like in the storytelling business. And I think that I forget that sometimes because the mode through which we tell the story is written. And at the end of the day, the goal, right, is to successfully tell our readers a story. And so the writing is a part of it, but it's not like the whole part of it. And so for me, it's like sometimes making the best choice in the service of story that feels like it might not necessarily be the best writing. Like, the fanciest or most show offy type writing. And so I think that that's a lesson um, that I've had to learn in lots of ways, like the hard way I've had to learn. Yeah. And, and as you can imagine, in a, in a writing program, that's where a lot of that gets addressed for the first time. You know, people haven't had to he hear that. You know, your best writing is not even good writing if it's in the wrong place. This might be a great sentence, a great metaphor, a great turn of phrase. Please, if there were seven of them on the page, 
please, you're going to have to make some decisions. But again, with the, is it a book or is it a body of work? You can relax because it will bubble up again someplace else down the line in your life. If it's worth it, it'll come back to you. Yeah. But, but if you try to jam them all in, they all damage each other. And I think it's like learning that, and what I learned in the program is there's a difference between being a good writer and being a good storyteller. And one of those things gets you published and it actually ha makes you have a career as a novelist. And the other thing is like, great, you're a great writer. You can write sentences that awe people, but if you can't put that together in a way that is satisfying in, for a reading experience, it doesn't matter at all how pretty the sentences you can construct are. And so I think like, th but that's a hard thing to learn, especially I think like when you are like very like, have come to the program because you're excited about like, the way that you can like phrase something. Yeah, and there's and the, there's a performative aspect to a program like that, as there is to the whole publishing bit. You know, something might read brilliantly out loud on a stage that you have it at home alone. You go, hmm. She brought something to the stage that isn't entirely here on the page. Um, that's we're here to separate one from the other, if they are separable. Sometimes both is, both things are true at the same time. But if, if you gotta pick one over the other, <clears throat> take the less, um, the less performative route because writing is, has bigger fish to fry than that. Yeah. yeah. And he just throws in a cliche for, for good measure. <laughs> no, but cliches work. They have their, their, they have their place. Yeah, you can say them. You just gotta write them. Do you write short stories? Um, not like just for myself. I recently have been asked to be a part of a lot of these like anthologies that people are putting together, and I've agreed to some of them mostly out of interest of like trying my hand at short stories because maybe it's like whatever it is you don't do, you always like idolize or glamorize so to me I'm always like oh the best writers are the writers that write these like really elegant short stories and I love like I read every year the collection they put out of like best American short stories or um if it's a novelist or particularly like I'll read their short story collection I am of the mind I almost always read a short story and I'm like oh I wish like there was more but I think that's like again the novelist part of my brain um, but I've been interested in trying them out again because I think it's such a great form to get to experiment with like the one that I just recently wrote is in third person and it's a really like sparse direct type style that is not a style I've written in in my novels and I think it's just such a great form to be able to like almost play dress up to like try on being a different writer for the 10 pages of a short story. Um, and kind of can be like a creative burst. And also to get, I know I like keep hammering the same thing, but in terms of finishing, like I, I liked it because I'll be in the weeds on a novel and then I'll have this short story for an anthology do. And I feel like really great about myself. Once <laughs> I, back, you know, bang out those 10 or 20 pages, like I'm like, oh, I finished something. And you remember that feeling of finishing, which can be like kind of intoxicating and bring you back to, to try to get your novel to that. But you're also modestly making light of that, whereas it can be a more <clears throat> a more profound something going on there because they are two very different kinds of energy, the way you work on a short story and the way you work on a novel, and they can help each other out if you're hopping from one to the other. And it doesn't it doesn't have to just be about, look, I'm really great <laughs> and I did this yeah. in a weekend. <laughs> no, but I think also too like in my from my short stories I've been reminded again about like economy of language sometimes I think like I trick myself into a novel being like oh I can describe this person's shirt for like two pages and it's like you don't need to do that in a novel either and you definitely can't do that in a short story and so I think that that's been good for me in the form of like how fast you can bring out those character details in a short story and I try to remember that to bring that same urgency the novel, especially with young people, because they don't want to like, you know, 
have long musings, which is something I'm something like that, at least we talked about before, that like I was just would read anything. And if the writing was like interesting enough, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna read these <laughs> settings. Whereas like my all my classes would be like, this is so boring. And I was like, it's like, oh, I think it's like, you know, fine. So I feel like I'm a bad judge sometimes of that. Okay. Now we can see how, how that happened to you because of how you approached reading books. And that's why you approached writing that way. It's like, yeah, these beautiful sentences, they're going to sustain me. Well, yeah. you probably already also learned how to plot. Um, mm -hmm. Here is a complete, so we're going to release you back into your very busy and fabulous and enviable life in a minute. But let me wind up with um, the really practical question. Um, What in your writing life, either in the deep past or recently, um, have you considered money well spent? We'll start with you saying just the word Leslie, and then we'll move on to the other less important answers, such as, you know, there are so many different things we can get caught up in, like the technology, right? I want this gadget, and I want this program, and I want this, and I've done it myself, and I bought something, and I go, you know what? It was a distraction from the fact that you have to do this. Yeah, that's actually how I feel about, like, the fancy MacBook Air I bought with, like, my first book advance, which is, like, the really cool one that I wanted, and it's great, but it didn't, like, make me... Yeah, so you can, you can also, sorry, you can also invert the question, what was not money well spent when it, when applying it directly to your writing life? Yeah, um, for me, which this is a kind of a niche answer, but the best money I ever spent was when my kids were little, I splurged and I got like a nanny for a couple of hours. I think that a nanny. I had um, thought that, oh, I'll write like when they're napping. And I did and stuff like that, but it was just so erratic, especially my kids are 16 months apart. And so I like, really had like two Sabrina Poots, but I had convinced myself again, like, oh, I'm so lucky. I have such a privileged job. I work from home. This is like insane for me to want to have childcare. And it was really, Greg stepped in and he was like, no, like you have a full-time job. This is like getting insane. At least that's higher in any for like the morning, which was always, has always been my best writing time. And just having those dedicated three hours, I think truly is the reason that I'm still working as a writer today and didn't like blow all of my deadlines or just like implode. So that was kind of like an investment in myself to like always know I have that period of time. And again, using that time. And I think like I've come to now value that of like being able to just sit down and use the time that I have, um, especially because when you're paying somebody per the hour, I'd always be thinking like, okay, like, <laughs> the ticker. Like, uh, worth it. So I think like investing in that time. Another thing that was like, which is similar is when we first moved to Chicago, um, we'd been moving from, we moved to Cincinnati where we had a house that was much larger than the apartment we moved to in Chicago. And when the nanny was there with the kids in Cincinnati, I would just work upstairs in my office. And once we moved to Chicago, I could hear everything. And that makes it like <laughs> work because if they're laughing, you want to know what it is. You feel like you're missing out. If they're crying, you like freak out and run up. And so um, I paid for one of those like memberships to like a co-working place where you just like show up with your laptop and other people are there and that was really, I was really productive there because in some ways you like simulate the office environment and the like pressure of other people working was like good for me because it like makes you take it seriously and like buckle down. Um, and I worked better there. Like I have friends who are cafe writers and I've never been because I like feel so much like social anxiety about like, am I buying enough things to like continue to sit here? And so that I think was like cafe writing for me in a way that like felt comfortable. And so that was really worthwhile. I don't like have any of the gadgets. I write on Microsoft Word. I know lots of people write in like those other programs like Scrivener, et cetera. But I feel like I would get, like I can barely understand how to use track changes when my editor sends over like the edits. So I'm not 
trying to like have a fancy plotting program. And again, we talked about like plot is like my weakest skill. So I think that I would get, I know myself that I would like try to think that it's going to like plot my book for me and it would actually just be um, like a hindrance. I, I also think like the best money I ever spend is like on buying books because I think that reading is the number one way to get better at writing. I find that so fascinating that so many people I talk to who want to be writers don't read. And I view my job, like, I think of it as reading even before writing. And that's just like, so anything where I'm like a subscription to magazine or short stories or reading books, or, I mean, I get a lot of my books from the library, but that's free, but I don't know. It's a good investment to pay taxes to invest in your library system. But um, yeah, I, I think that the, that kind of stuff, I, it's a boring answer. I don't have like, I don't even know what you would have. I see people like they have those alpha smart things. Like I see that a lot on Instagram, which are like, I don't know if you've seen these, they're like basically like fake typewriters that like don't have the internet and you just write and then you load it on your computer. And again, I think it's like a trick because it's like, if you have the, um, what would that be? The like, s the self will or the willpower, that's where I was searching for the willpower to like use that instead of your laptop. Why can't you just turn the Wi Fi off on your laptop? And then it's the exact same thing. I don't know. Again, I'm like very spending. Judgmental. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't want to buy things that I don't need to buy. Um, <clears throat> very, like, I guess it's one of the few places in my life I like to have conservative impulses, but it's just like, I don't, I'm scared of like, my computer that I work on is like from 2011. I kid you not, the desktop. Um, and I'm, I'm, staring, I'm staring at you through such a, such a machine. Yes, and it runs, it runs this, it runs Microsoft Word, and I'm gonna try to keep it as long as possible. My car is like 12 years old. I'm just like not a. a my, my car is 16 years old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is like I don't know. So I I and I think like writing at least what's nice. I remember one of my best friends um, was a fine artist, and he always used to tell me like you're so lucky that your art form doesn't have like a lot of expenses associated with being able to do it. Because like for him, he had to buy acrylic paint and canvas and all these things that are like expensive to even try to get into the game. Um, and not to downplay the cost of a computer. Like I recognize it's an expensive thing, which is why I still have this one from 2011. But I do think that we're lucky that it's like, we don't need, like you don't need any of those things to be able to do your job. Um, you like, yeah, so I don't know what you would spend, like gadgets, like pens. I get those on Amazon. I don't know. <laughs> say that word. Um, um, yeah. All of that, all of that was wonderful. All of that going back to the beginning an hour ago was wonderful. That was. Thank you, Jasmine, for doing this. Um, I was going to say you're going to be now inundated with probably emails from from Leslie alumni, but then again, you went and answered every question, so there's no need to contact you. So I think your your time is still safe. Okay. Well, um, it was so nice to see you. It was um, great. Actually, well, it's nice. Um, see Steve and Steve Wells. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Pleasure seeing you.